Cool. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm John. This is Vivian. Um, we are working on a project called uh, Lumio, and uh, Vivian's prepared um, quite an excellent talk. She was showing it to me earlier. Um, so I'm just going to kind of be here um, supporting her and filling in any of the gaps or blanks here or there. And, um, and then afterwards, um, we'll have the question and answers. And um, I kind of, I work on the product side of things Vivi and user experience. Vivian handles more of the um, you know, re relationships with customers and, and business development and that sort of thing. So I think between the two of us, we should be able to cover it all. Sweet. Cool. So um, we're talking about Lumio, which is a New Zealand startup, although it's a global business, um, currently in 30 countries in 15 languages. And um, we're just at that really exciting point of um, getting into a, a minimum scalable product. So um, just with that bit of background, Lumio is a really easy to use online decision making tool. Um, and it, it, it aims to do nothing less then change the way people make decisions in the world. So just a small vision. And um, it, at its core, it's three really simple ideas. Uh, it's about productive, rich group discussion. It's about having that discussion inform a group decision. And then from a group decision, it's about engaged, supported action. And um, to give you a sense of the power of this very kind of simple idea and its relevance to all of us and the discussion today about um, eco-technology, I wanted to invite you to think about, just for a moment, decisions being made in your life, um, where we make decisions in our families and our sports clubs and our workplaces in our communities, in our countries, and indeed in the world. And I wanted you to just ask yourself the question, um, in any of those places in your life, are there decisions being made that you would like more say in? That you would like to be able to participate in more fully? And you might want to chat to the person sitting beside you just for a moment about what's running through your mind right now. Are there any places in your life, in your family, in your wider community relationships, in your country, where there are decisions being made that you would like to have more say in? So I'm wondering if anyone would like to share anything that um, came up. Anybody um, have an example of something happening that they would like more say in? I was wondering whether offshore drilling might not come up in New Zealand right now. <laughs> Local waste disposal, absolutely. What else? What else came up? Where the family might holiday next Christmas. Great, Se having a say about sex education in schools, totally. Yep. So the, um, the thing that we found somewhat surprisingly to us about Lumio is that the groups who want to use it, um, which started out being about activists, has grown really fast to many, many environments where people <laughs> naturally want to be involved in the decisions that affect them. So Lumio right now is being used by local governments, it's being used in schools, it's being used by businesses, by social activist networks, almost anywhere where people want to collaborate but are either time poor or uh, resource poor, you know, travelling to get together, or the idea of getting together is just impossible. In all these places, Lumio is being used. So the real question for today is not, you know, what is Lumio so much, but why is it? And what is it for? What does it serve? Th those are the kinds of questions that, um, that the, the Lumio team, the 15 of us really engaged in working in Lumio, are asking. 
And um, that leads to the, the kind of the, the, um, the founding story of Lumio, which, um, which John was absolutely a part of, and um, he'll, he'll give you a bit of an insight into that. Cool. <coughs> yeah, so um, for me it started, um, well, I guess just before Occupy um, kind of happened throughout, um, throughout the world when I was kind of thinking about um, the current, current capitalist system and, and sort of the, the inequality and, and the, the, um, all of the decisions that, you know, we didn't have a say and that we wanted to have a say in. Um, and thinking about that and then um, Occupy happened and I, and I went down to Occupy Wellington um, and we started making, um, meeting together and making decisions together and, um, you know, I met a whole bunch of other people who were, th you know, thinking about similar things. But, the, you know, the really amazing kind of transformative and eye-opening um, bit for me was just the actual process of decision-making itself that was happening at Occupy. So, um, you know, we'd have to all sit down in a circle, like 50 or 60 of us, and decide how, how are we going to make sure this was a safe space? And how are we going to, you know, make sure to feed everyone? Um, and, and that process was... was um, pretty amazing at times when, you know, someone would have one suggestion for, you know, how, how um, we might solve one of these problems and, and somebody else would be like, oh, well, no, the issue there is because of this, that, and the other. And, and just watching the group collaborate, these people, complete strangers, um, but go, going through this process of consensus building, coming up with solutions that were better than, you know, any one person could have come up with on their own. Um, but then at the same time experiencing the the agony and pain when you get, you know, like two people who just fundamentally disagree with each other and their egos are just fighting it out and you, everybody's sitting there at this meeting for like three hours and you just have to wait and, um, you know, so there was a lot of painful moments there as well and, um, you know, for us the obvious thought was like, what if you could take this process and, and put it online? Um, then, then it means that you don't all have to meet in the same place at the same time to still have that deliberation and that, um, you know, that dialogue that leads to constructive action, um, you know, and if, if two people are having a conflict, they can, they can either um, maybe s solve it on their own time, or even if they are having this heated discussion online, you know, you can kind of scroll past it so you don't have to sit there for an hour. Um, and, and I just started thinking as well, okay, that this means this could open up decision making not just to... Um, uh, the people in Wellington, but also Occupy Auckland and, and, you know, Sydney. And, you know, you just start imagining it scaling out and out. And we're like, whoa, this could be really big. But that was just the start of it. So, you know, we started talking about that. Um, we ended up um, meeting some people from Inspiral. Um, and, and they were like, um, yeah, this is great. You know, we're a horizontal organization. And um, we really need to make... Um, decisions as well collectively, but right now it's really hard. There's just a couple of us that end up making most of the decisions just because of the energy of, and, and the um, re resources required to you know, try and involve a whole bunch of people in collective decisions. So you know, Josh ended up making a, l a large percentage of the decisions back in the day. Um, so we had a meeting and they were like, yeah, that's great. And, and we were convinced that um, they, would, they would build it for us, we would just be like, yep, yeah, and they're like, yeah, this is good, and then a month later, there would be this decision-making tool, and we'd use it for Occupy, and we'd use it for whatever else, and that'd be great, but, um, and, you know, it'd be open source as well, and the world would just take it away um, and go with it, take it and run with it, but um, we had the meeting, and they were like, this is great, and um, we don't have the resources to build it, so you're going to have to do it, and um, I was kind of like, hmm, okay, well, I, I guess I know a little bit about programming. Um, so with their support, you know, they gave us a place, um, um, a space to work in and mentorship. Um, we started building a this social enterprise, um, and very quickly realized that this isn't this isn't so an issue that just affects um, you know people at Occupy. This is a deci decisions and are something that everyone is involved in all the time. You know, whether it's your country or your community um, or your business. Um, and so kind of away we went, and here we are like two years later. So the journey for me is a little bit different because I've spent 30 years working in the community sector in New Zealand, um, mostly in human rights organisations, and uh, most of my uh, real reflective learning has been through participating in the stewardship learning community, which has been meeting over the last 25 years or so. Um, 
in the 1980s, there might be other women in the room who were involved in women's collectives and women's movement work. Um, and, you know, pretty much we failed at achieving um, a new power structure organisationally. Um, I think Women's Refuge is the only women's collective organisation left. And I've spent a lot of time working with them over the last few years. And they, they run like a series of independent incorporated societies, not really like a collective. So the culture and um, form of alternative power structures and organisations, which really Occupy was calling for, has um, over many decades, all the decades of my working life, failed to really be resourced with tools that make that possible. So what I learned in the 80s was that, you know, conviction and passion and really wanting it to work wasn't enough to make it work. And so when I met John and the other young people involved with Lumio, what I got was that now the internet provided a platform that could make things that we tried really hard and failed at 30 years ago entirely doable now. And to me, that was an incredibly exciting moment to think that, um, you know, stuff that was still important but really on the back burner um, could now come forward. In the meantime, I'd spent 15 years as chief executive of, serious, of a series of large New Zealand community organisations and really it, it had immersed myself in hierarchical structures all the time with real questions about whether this was the best way to get the best out of what we were doing. The best way from the point of view of um, charitable paradigms, which always work with what's left, um, or are defined by what a government wants to purchase or a phila ph philanthropist wants to support, or the best way from the point of view of organisational hierarchy, and um, I can hear myself say very regularly, how would I organise this organisation of 800 people in such a way that everyone felt like they had a stake, that everybody felt like they were an owner, they worked like an owner. So um, I, I formed a view about two or three years ago that capitalism and charity are two sides of the same coin. They're both broken. They are equally broken. That, by definition, the problems caused by the excesses of shareholder capitalism in the world define the resources available f to those organisations who define themselves by fixing those excesses. The community sector is, by definition, risk-averse. It has to be, because it's using other people's money. And failure for the public who are donating money or for the philanthropists investing money is unacceptable. So that makes innovation, you know, real new systemic thinking, really hard. Making mistakes is just not um, part of a learning journey like it is in entrepreneurship. It's, um, it's a reason for court cases and... Um, turnover of senior staff and resignations of boards. So for these reasons, after 30 years of community sector work, I reached the conclusion that scalable, global social change and social justice is not possible using NGO and capitalist paradigms. And we did some talking about paradigms um, earlier in our gathering. Um, I want to make a distinction between um, what I'm saying here and between using the market and the tools of business or the cultural wealth of communities, um, I think that's quite different. I think we must use the wealth and knowledge of community and community development and the wealth and knowledge of business and combine them in new ways to get to scalable social change. Mm. Uh, um, I think in particular that business speaks to scale and pace and momentum and markets in ways that in the community sector we've never really got a, ha a handle on. And I'll just add that that's the same, same thing for me coming from um, an activist background uh, at Occupy. You know, um, 
you can kind of, you, re you realize at a certain point that you can, you know, scream as loudly as you want, but that, that's totally different from, you know, actually building, building alternative solutions. Um, and so for us, like for me personally, when we first went to Inspiral and, and Joshua kept on saying like, you need to turn this into a business. <laughs> I was just like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, coming, coming from um, this almost anti-capitalist um, background, I, I just thought like, oh, no, businesses are what, the problem that got us here. And, and for me personally, uh, there was a really big shift in thinking and a really big um, like gotcha moment when I saw how the tools of business could be used to scale social impact. And I think um, that's been a really big part of the Lumio story is... Um, growing a new kind of organisation in the space between uh, um, community sector and charitable organisations and businesses. Um, and, and like all new things, it creates some reaction. Um, but always coming back to the idea, the simple idea that um, we are visioning a world where everyone affected by a decision can be involved in making it. It's a simple idea, but it's a complex thing to achieve because, of course, it's cultural change and that's systemic. And our own system has become really important to us. Lumio is a social enterprise. It aims to scale. It wants to make a whole bunch of money because it wants to have money to invest in further scale and further social change. In order to uh, achieve that, we formed a cooperative. And right now, it's a workers' cooperative. Um, so everybody who works in the business owns it. We all have one share each. And as we mature and develop, there will be other um, shareholding members of the cooperative like our channel partners who are our distribution network and our users. So that all the people involved in using Lumio will have a say in um, how it develops. And that's given rise to the idea that one of the things that Lumio is about as a disruption technology is building new public infrastructure. And I've only really come to grips with this idea because it's very outside of my experience. The, you know, working in an internet business has been outside of my experience until the last two years. We take, we take for granted that the roads we use are um, publicly owned by and large. Every now and again we use a toll to get some new development but then it reverts in New Zealand to being free again. We haven't carried over that thinking to the internet. So we're seeing this huge rise of the internet in the world, largely owned by private companies, without really considering that these new public spaces we're growing, Facebook or Google+, are owned by somebody else, not us. And we're playing in those spaces like it's a playground where somebody's recording our conversations and then selling the data. So the politics of this internet space has suddenly arrived full-blown in our lives. And um, as Lumio has started to be picked up around the world, we've become more and more conscious of the idea of growing um, infrastructure that all people own and that the data that you put in there is yours. And, um, and that uh, you can take a copy of the code and use your your own version of it. And we're really delighted that in the last couple of weeks, um, Wikimedia, who we spent some time with in San Francisco, um, Sue Gardner, who's the chief executive there, has led out on starting Wikimedia's own version of Lumio in order to um, be making better decisions in the back end of Wikipedia. And that kind of like makes our heart beat fast and it makes us start to feel like... Um, we're part of a community, an open source community, a global community who feels passionately right alongside us about that, the way we grow this resource called the internet. Um, one of the ways to make Lumio most grabbable is to tell some stories about who's using it. And Link said, just as we were walking in the door, you know, read out the quote from the woman in Brazil, 
And, you know, I haven't got the quote from the woman in Brazil. But let me tell you, um, it, some months ago now, six months would it be, when people in Brazil were hitting the streets because bus fares had gone up and it was kind of like their last straw and hundreds of thousands of Brazilians protested. And within hours, we had an email from a young woman called uh, Myra who said, um, in Brazil right now, as you will know, we are inquiring into the meaning of democracy. And we are, um, we are worrying we've forgotten how to do democracy well. Some core things are missing in our lives, like engaged discussion, like um, focused, inclusive decision-making, and like people feeling like we can have a say in the way our country goes. Lumio looks like a platform we can use to engage each other in deciding together what democracy should mean for us. And we kind of all stood there and looked at this email and sort of cried. And went, wow, that's it's such a powerful um, summary of what is democracy, but also the challenge in the world right now, which is... Um, does it just mean voting once every four or five years? Or does it mean something much more than that? And, um, and that's what Lumio is beginning to be. It's beginning to be uh, what you do after you've protested to rebuild the positive action you want to take in order that in your family or your community or your workplace, um, everybody who is part of that um, can easily have, have a say. The way we think about Lumio is as a Trojan horse. Um, it, it is a disruption technology. It solves ordinary problems. You know, like the problem of how do you really fit in all the meetings you could go to? Um, as opposed to get momentum in action. How do you, in an organisation of 800 people, hear from the most marginalised of that organisation, the ones furthest from the head office? Or if you're a, a multinational country, and you I mean country, a multinational organisation, and you're trying to make decisions across time zones, how do you make that easy to do? But act, so that's the, that's the reason why people start using Lumio, those kind of everyday problems. But what they find once they start using it is um, a platform that grows our confidence around collaboration. So right now the European Youth Pirate Party are using Lumio. To, um, they, they, they've got their act together way faster than the pirate party itself, who haven't yet formed a European. There's a German one and a French one and an Italian one, but they haven't got organised um, to get a European one together. But the young people have, and they're using Lumio to make all their decisions about um, priority policies that w they will then run through liquid feedback, which is their much more complex, bigger um, software that they use um, for, uh, um, l you know, like hundreds of thousands of people to participate in policy making. Hmm. And kind of just on that note about, um, you know, Lumio being a Trojan horse and, and people originally using it just for, you know, kind of maybe born day to day sort of stuff, it really ties in, in my mind, to what Joshua was talking about yesterday in terms of you know, creating these viruses which you can kind of send into companies which then go and actually change the, the DNA of a company or of a culture. And so for us, um, we like to see Lumio as this, you know, just really efficient, easy to use tool. Like, oh, of, co of course we're going to use Lumio to make decisions um, because it means, um, you know, we get better decisions faster. Um, but what's kind of subtly happening is by an organization using Lumio, they're actually subtly becoming more democratic, more participatory. We really love that strike debt. Who, who here has heard of strike debt? Who are the Americans in the room who know about strike debt? So strike debt is one of the offshoots of Occupy Movement, and they, a little group of people from in New York, decided that they would 
um, crowdfund um, money with which to buy health debt from poor people in America. So that in New York, they started off ran a crowdfunding campaign and raised $400,000, with, with which they bought $15 million of health debt. And um, th they are now uh, scaling right around America with um, strike debt groups starting up all around the country. And we feel very chuffed that they are organising on Lumio. Um, so this is a, a New Zealand kind of like outcropping of Occupy that's supporting strike debt, which is another initiative out of Occupy. And I love those stories because lots of people I meet tell me that Occupy failed. And, um, you know, I think Occupy has barely begun and we're yet to see the, um, the intergenerational learning and um, initiatives that come out of it. Um, one of the groups using Lumio more and more is um, different councils throughout London. And they are using Lumio because they want multi-stakeholder input to neighbourhood decision making. And they've got resources and focus on making that happen. So um, Lumio, kind of by accident, is a global business. And our challenges are about how we get the distribution of that um, right for the kind of business we are. Um, our challenge in terms of product is how we do a good enough job of our development pathway so we get rapid organic growth. And we're just kind of on the cusp of that right now. Our challenge is also to build Lumio with enough, a light enough touch but a clever enough design that we introduce the, um, the craft of collaboration wherever Lumio is being used. We just completed uh, a world trip um, as a result of being invited by the World Forum on Democracy to present Lumio in Strasbourg in France and um, went to about six countries, including coming home through America. And um, one of our inquiries was social impact investment. And we've come home feeling incredibly excited about the large investment organisations internationally who want to invest in social enterprise. And, you know, their, um, their main criteria are not what is your legal structure, are not um, are you for profit or not for profit, um, or which country are you which in? Which country are you in? But rather, what's your measurable social impact? So an organisation like Nesta in London would totally delight, be delighted to invest in Lumio um, so long as we can measure the social um, impact that's happening in the UK as the result of Lumio being used. We're delighted right now to be working with a um, partner in the UK who's got a community of 24,000 people living with mental illness being run off an internet um, platform that doesn't serve their needs and they're shifting the whole community into Lumio and funding our development pathway so they get the features that they want in order to deliver to this community of 24,000 people. And the social impact outcomes of that are really clear. So we immediately have a partnership that we can take to Nesta, a project in the UK, and um, uh, so that's you know, really exciting to us. Um, Brian and Matthew here introduced us to Carlos at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, and I was blown away by how focused on problem solving this man was. You know, in America, there's particular laws about charity, but if you're not a registered charity, that's fine because we do it like this and we work it like that and, um, you know, we've got this kind of fund and that kind of fund. How can we work with you? It's such a different experience. It's such a more mature, collaborative, peer-based experience than my experience of any kind of fundraising in the New Zealand context. It really was powerfully positive for us to just go and be part of those conversations. Omidja um, Foundation. Um, you know, th these are organisations who are investing billions of dollars. 
And they just ran through their head um, investment person again, who we got to through Brian and Matthew's introductions, just sat us down and said, are you open source? Are you a mission-driven organisation? Are you potentially able to globally scale? You know, they had about five questions, and with every tick, they opened up more resource. Um, I just found it incredibly heartwarming, and it reminded me there are wonderful things about growing a social enterprise in New Zealand, but truly, the, the scope and possibility and opportunity doesn't come into focus until you're out in the world. So... Um, we are back here in New Zealand now. We're about to run a crowdfunding campaign that will be our international launch of Lumio and um, will deliver us the money we need to complete our development pathway to achieve that minimum scalable product. And um, once we've got weekly, substantive weekly user growth pathway, then we've got three or four large organisations ready to invest whatever we need. So that's our uh, trajectory for 2014. We're incredibly excited about it, um, really focused. We've got lots of learning and deepening to do around our horizontal organisation. Um, but really, without trying, being in 30 countries and 15 languages, um, we're just celebrating that and being really grateful for each other and the support we've had from the global open source internet activist community. Thank you. So before we finish, a couple of things. Um, I some of you won't have seen How Communities Heal, which is um, a book about New Zealand social entrepreneurs and the work that's been done. Probably the first publication in New Zealand about um, communities and community work. And there's four copies here. Please feel free to grab one if that you feel like it's got your name on it. And the other thing is, um, you know, part of my work in the world is around holding resonance. I call it resonance magic. And this morning I was looking at my crystal collection and this crystal talked to me about community and diversity. And I wanted to give it to you, Brian and Matthew, here for your community as you get underway at this um, rich learning and community building you're doing um, to remind you about all the little bits that go into creating a whole. So thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions, okay. so. Thanks for that presentation, Viv and John. Um, getting to know you guys and the team uh, over the past 11 months, one of the uh, things I really admire about Lumio is just the cohesion of the team. Uh, I haven't seen many teams that work really well together. Um, I'm curious to hear from you guys, what are the lessons you have learned about you know, getting a team so aligned behind a vision that each person is sacrificing so much um, to work towards it and, and work together by putting a bit less emphasis on personal ego and a lot more emphasis on the vision. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing that came to mind when you said that, yes, it was um, cooperative and, and cooperating, you know? Um, when I, I'm on the product team, so I, I, don't, I don't deal as much on the business side. And so um, when Vivian and, and Ben you know, and, and a couple other people on that side of the organization started talking about the idea of us turning, becoming a cooperative. At first, I was a bit skeptical, you know, because I was like, oh, it seems like a lot of extra, you know, I don't know, red tape or, you know, you know just like, why don't we just set up as like a traditional company or a nonprofit or whatever. Um, but now, as I've seen more people join our organization and um, become cooperative members, and as we invite them to become owners of the business and seeing how instantly, overnight, as soon the, our most three recent cooperative members, they worked for six months as, as contributors, and as soon as we invited them in as, as worker owners, um, it just changed their relationship to the business instantly. It became less about them and more about how do I help keep this thing alive and make it thrive. Um, so I think that has been one of the really big things that I've seen. People bring their whole self to work every day. So that's one thing. I mean, <clears throat> I think that 
the uh, value base of Lumio right from the beginning was really clear, that the wanting to be part of not just creating a collaboration tool, but a new organisational um, model. We, we see ourselves as map makers. So in order to do that well, we need to live it. And the kind of the, the discussion and the work that goes into, you know, how without any bosses you keep um, real focus on momentum and productivity, um, that means everybody's got to be good at supportive, nurturing conversations, and everybody's got to be good at tough, challenging conversations. I, I was really struck, Joe, in your presentation earlier about the, the hand of God. Uh, well, of course, in my world, it'll be the hand of the goddess. Uh, um, uh, and I think we've, we've overemphasised. In our conversations, I've called this the balance between power and love. Um, we've almost fallen into the trap of being so accepting and loving, that hand is the hand of support, and there's not much shove behind it. And, uh, uh, you know, one of our learning edges about our team culture is how we get this wonderful mix between the, um, the brutality of the task of getting up the hill and um, doing that together as a team. And so, um, you know, it, it remains a challenge, but it's almost one of the points of engagement. Everyone who comes into Lumio stays because they are entranced by that dance. Yeah. I just thought it was an amazing tool, obviously, quite inspirational for the here and now and, and us trying to solve the problems that we've probably all grown up with. I'm just wondering, um, the first thing I thought, what would this look like in a family scenario and have you seen it deployed and have you seen how children kind of embrace yeah. this new way because we haven't grown up with it and watching them grow up with it is probably going to accelerate it or would be an inspiration for me. So mm, awesome, yes. I mean, this is one of our big... Um, dreams and uh, right now in New Zealand there are four schools using Lumio. They are all intermediate age schools, so that's um, 10, 11, 12. And um, school the, 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 the students' council um, are using Lumio to have their say and their input into the school board of trustees. And in some instances, um, student groups are using Lumio to ad as activists in their school to advocate against, you know, we shouldn't have homework, we, there's plenty of proof that it doesn't work, or I want to be able to use my scooter in the playground at lunchtime and, and right now the rules say I can't, so let's see what people think about that. So um, Ben Knight, if he was here, would say his vision is that the next generation grows up expecting to be involved in decisions that affect them. But more than that, expecting to support everybody in the ecosystem of that decision to be involved. So this is the shift from my right to have my say to a paradigm whereby part of my role is to ensure that everybody affected by this decision is having a say about it and that that becomes the norm. So um, in families, we've been blown away by the way families are using Lumio. Um, most recently, th this is a really um, touching story, a, a woman who heard us talk on the radio, who we had never met, rang us up very early in the Lumio story and said, I heard you on national radio, I love what you're doing, I really believe in it, I'd like to give you $15 a week um, to help you. And so for the last two years, she's been paying us $15 a week, which is pretty amazing. And um, just in the last few months, her son, who's actually visited us, he's a 21-year-old, has been diagnosed as having leukaemia. And um, he's in Australia, and she's here, and he's got a brother in England, and people who care about him all around the world, and they formed a Lumio group so that he stays in control of communication. He's not bombarded with emails, but he can share and talk and ask for help. And um, that's starting to take off in the, um, in the sort of the, can I say, the cancer community. So, you know, they're sharing with other families who are starting Lumio groups. And, well, we never dreamed that that is how Lumio would be used, but it is being. 
um, we have a family who own a piece of land, a biodiversity park, and, um, you know, the parents are in Dunedin and there's children in UK and Australia and New Zealand, and they make all that, they never meet, they make all their decisions as a family about this biodiversity park um, on Lumio. So yeah, it's pretty exciting. Hi Viv, um, I'm really curious about what you said about the, your 30 years of experience before this leading up to sort of seeing this as a tool which allows things to be possible which didn't seem like they were possible before. I've spent most of my life sort of managing people or projects. And for me, it's always seemed that the biggest challenge I've had is actually dragging people away from their computers and making them sit down and talk face to face, right? And that so much more can happen face to face than that can happen behind a monitor. And it sounds like you're saying the opposite. And I'm really curious about what your reflections around that are. Yeah, nice point. Um, I, I absolutely don't think it's either or. Um, it, but I do think that, that, that uh, we are increasingly very local and very global. And we need to be able to operate really skillfully in both spaces. So when you're very local, face-to-face -face can work. It still marginalises some people. And um, so it, the combination of local, like for example in Wellington, the Wellington City Council used Lumio to have a conversation with people about um, alcohol management strategy for the city. Now they also had face-to-face -face meetings, but the people who engaged online were not the people who engaged in face-to-face -face meetings. So overall, the council heard from a much greater diversity of people by doing both than if they'd done either. For global businesses though, or global networks or organisations, getting together just isn't real. It isn't going to happen. Um, one business, uh, who some of you may know, Catherine Koroch's business, um, who's a New Zealand woman with a global business based in London. Um, she, they have their management meetings at midnight um, weekly, just because that's the best time for that's the best time zone they can get for everyone to be there. Well, Lumio just solves that problem for them. You know, they make decisions in their own time zone with the same momentum without someone having to be awake at midnight. So um, it's not either or. When I was referring to something that is possible now that wasn't possible then, I just think that um, in our women's collective vision about uh, collectivism as an organising principle rather than hierarchy, we, we just didn't have tools. We had cultural form, we had intent, but we didn't have things that would make that easier. And that's what I mean. I just think that the internet offers things that would make that easier. Um, we met with a woman called Anne-Marie Slaughter in Washington who is leading out on a part of the American government's work on growing democracy in the developing world. And, um, you know, this is an incredibly high-powered woman um, one of the really fantastic things about being in America compared to the rest of the world was that there was women's leadership in the internet space that I didn't see anywhere else. I was so delighted to meet these women, like um, Sue Gardner and um, Anne-Marie Slaughter. But she's working with people to grow... I haven't got the right, ja the right language, but like when you've got internet connectivity without going on the internet, like people grew in the Occupy movement, so that... Pardon? Yeah, the whole peer-to-peer -peer thing. And so she's combining that with Lumio. So countries in developing worlds have not only got connectivity, but they've got a platform to make decisions about how they're going to use it. Well, n both those things come out of the possibility of the internet. Neither of them would be possible without the internet. Both of them can be done really cheaply so that emerging democracies can grow a whole relationship to participation that we are going to have to catch up with in this more developed world. Great, thank you.